Good. Do a favor. Uh, tell the person right beside you, it is really good to see you this morning. Either side of you, both sides, front and back, just let them know you're glad to see them in church. Me? Y'all look good today? And if you could do me one quick favor, Tiffany does an awesome job with this stuff. Would you just give her a hand and say thank you for your faithfulness in this? She's a little ball of energy, and she points it in the right direction. So that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I wanted to uh, let the kids know, if you are in f- uh, fourth or fifth grade, you are dismissed now for Club 45. If you're back there, Dylan, can you wave at them so they know where to go? Dylan's back there. And you guys are, are free to go. We're excited uh, for you. Have an awesome time. Learn about Jesus. And I want to let you know, too, this morning's going to be a little different. I filled you in last week on some of it. But um, so... Some of the chapters in the book of Acts are long, like really long, including the one we're going to look at today. So what we're doing is we're going to do part one and part two. Now, if we did this with every chapter and broke it down every weekend, we'd be doing this book for 17 years. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to do part one and part two by campus. So today, Bill is in Bellevue, and he's doing part one. I'm here, I'm doing part two. If, to catch up, what I'd encourage you to do, both of these messages will be uploaded today. I would encourage you sometime this week, go on and catch, since you're here, catch Bill's part one, because there's some pretty awesome stuff that you'll hear about in the first part of Acts chapter five. And then the people in Bellevue are going to be encouraged to kind of catch on to what we're talking about here today. When you get in your life groups, you'll be talking about both parts, uh, part one and part two. But just during the week, I'd encourage you to to go and basically you get to have church twice this week. Make it more than just about the Sunday morning and hopefully learn throughout the week. Now, as I said, it's a big chapter, but man, it's an exciting chapter. So you come off of chapter 4, which we talked about last week, and into chapter 5, and God does some amazing stuff. Verses uh, 12 through 16, you read about miracles. You read about God's hand moving through the church, deliverance, provision. In the first part of the chapter, I don't want to steal uh, Bill Thunder, but judgment that God brings to those who are trying to deceive the local church and take advantage. God is at work. He's moving in the followers, in the people who are Jesus followers. And we're going to see that today he's still doing the same stuff. But before we get there... We kind of come to our part of the passage, which is toward uh, the last half of the chapter. We'll pick up reading at uh, Acts 5, verse 17 in a minute. But as these miracles are going on, as the move of the Holy Spirit is happening, those who are more about themselves than the move of God start getting jealous. When God moves, we have two responses. One is, praise God, let him be seen. And the other is, look what God's doing through me. And unfortunately, there's this group who says, hey, someone's stealing our spotlight. Let's pick up reading at verse 17. It says, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said. And tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. I want you to stop right there for a second. I want you to think about this scene as if you were the captain of the guards. 
You were the lead guard. So you have these two men who have been arrested. They've been put in jail. You've got locked doors. You've got guards out front. They're, front, they're armed and loaded. They are doing their job. In comes the Supreme Court. We talked about this last week. The Sanhedrin was kind of like the highest ranking uh, authority. In comes the Sanhedrin, and it says it's not just a little bit of it. It's the full council. It's everybody. This is a big deal. They call you in. They say, go get the prisoner. You're thinking, my men have done their job. My soldiers have stood guard. You go, and there's soldiers playing soldier and standing guard. There's gates that are locked to make sure everything is secure. And there are no prisoners inside the jail. That's not a good day. Because as we'll talk about later on in the chapter, we'll see it play out, is if, if prisoners escape, guards are put to death. So you've got guards playing guard. You've got prison, door, prison doors locked doing what they're supposed to do, but doing it for no one because there's no prisoners in there. He, you come back. If you're the lead guard and you know your neck is on the line, you come back, you tell the Sanhedrin, you know, my guys are doing their job. Jail doors, nice and secure, but there's no one inside. Are you, are you sure you put them in there? All of a sudden, the Sanhedrin starts thinking, what are these guys doing? I bet they're on the run. I bet they're headed back to Galilee where, where Peter's from. They're going to hide out with family. Or I bet they've, they've bolted for the other side and they're in some Gentile nation because they're afraid of us. We need to put an APB out. We've got we to gotta catch these guys because they're going to hide from us. Um, hey, guys. Actually, they're right outside the window. And they're doing the very thing you told them not to do. Let's pick up reading verse 27. It says, The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to, que to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So you've got these apostles. Now remember this. Number one, the apostles are fugitives. They've broken out of jail. Number two, they are heretics. They're preaching of another king. They're preaching of this Jesus who came and they say is God. Number three is they are right now a match and a pile of very dry and brittle leaves. Palestine like it is today, back then, was always right on the brink of war, right on the brink of fighting. And in comes these apostles saying, hey, there's another king. There's a risen savior. And those guys in there, that group of Sadducees, Pharisees, that Sanhedrin, they put him to death. You've got this hostile, volatile environment who already hates the government that's in place. And now you've got these men that it feels like they're poking the bear a little bit. If you're a Sanhedrin member, you don't want this to happen. You're fearful of what could happen because, as we talked about this a little last week, Rome, who was the overall authority of the world at that point, Rome had said to the Sanhedrin, and especially the Sadducees, if you can keep your people in line, if you can keep this hotbed mess in line, we'll give you power. We'll give you the authority to do what you need to do to keep them in order. But if you can't do it, we will. And if we do it, it's not going to be pretty, and you guys are going to be out. Peter and John were the last thing that the, that the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the leading rulers, this is the last thing they wanted to see. The Sadducees love the fact that they got power. They love the fact that they were put in control and given authority. And now they're hearing this message of someone who was resurrected from the dead. Remember we said last week that the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection from the dead. That's why they were sad, you see? So now these people who are everything, Peter and John and these new believers who are everything that the government, the leadership does not want them to be, they're being allowed 
and bold and in their face. Three things we see about these men at this point. First of all, they were men of courage. They were not afraid of what the religious leaders or the rulers, political leaders may think. It says that they went straight back to teaching and preaching and not in a corner right there in the temple court, right there in the middle of where they had been put on trial. It's almost a, like a reckless audacity that we don't care what you think. Our first faithfulness is to Jesus. Secondly, there were so men, uh, men of boldness, but secondly, men of principle. These are men and women, this first century church, of principle. And here's the ruling principle for their life. The ruling principle was that in all circumstances, obedience to God must come first. In all circumstances, no matter what's going on, no matter what people think, no matter what our position, no matter what favor or, or dishonor we think we'll get, step one, follow God. Be faithful to Him. So these are men of courage and men and women of, of principle. And here's the third thing. They knew what they were called to do. They had a clear idea of their function. They knew what they were supposed to do. And here's what it was. Be a witness for Jesus. Now, early on in this series, we talked about that word witness because the word witness means someone who has firsthand experience. And these disciples, these early followers of Jesus, and we today who say, I'm a Jesus follower. I, I know what he's done in my life. I know how I've seen him move. We're to be witnesses. It doesn't mean we have all the answers. It doesn't mean we're spit and polish and we have all the perfect ways of saying things, but it means that we understand what Jesus has done and what Jesus can do. We're witnesses, but this word witness has a double meaning. And the second meaning for this word witness in the original language is martyr. So I'm going to talk about what I know Jesus has done and can do from firsthand experience, but I also understand that it may cost me everything. This early church understood that at any expense, they were going to be people of courage, people of principle, and they were going to fulfill what God had call, called them to do. So they go on trial. They tick everybody off. You may be in the Sanhedrin and you think you're really important and you give an order and you expect people to jump when you say jump and bow when you say bow. And Peter and John say, look, you're not first on the list. You're not the first one we're going to listen to. Everyone's getting hot. And then in steps, probably my favorite, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, one of my favorite people that we'll read about. Picture it, everyone's freaking out. They won't listen. They're teaching what we believe is heresy. And now they're, they're going against the government, which means Rome may step in. Let's put them to death. We'll see that in a second. Well, let's just put them to death. We put other people to death. Even Jesus came in. You know, he was put to death. Let's just knock these guys off. And then in steps Gamaliel. Let's start reading verse 33. It says, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all of his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His, sweet, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering dis disgrace, suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. 
Remember last week we talked about the, Fer- the Sadducees. Their disbelief in the resurrection, their favor with people, they liked the seats, they, they were more about people than they were about the law. The flip side of that is the Pharisees. The Pharisees were uh, against the government. They wanted to make sure they got every T crossed, every I dotted, every perfect punctuation. Their nose was in the book. If anybody knew the Bible of that time, the law and the prophets, it was the Pharisees. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were against each other. And the Pharisees were the ones you went to if you wanted truth. And the Sadducees were the ones you went to if you wanted to see grace. And then in the picture steps this guy, Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was more than just respected. He's loved. And he had a kindness. And yet at the same time, he had an embracing of the truth. He found that balance that we see talked about in Scripture of grace and truth. Love and law. And Gamaliel was given a title. If you look through antiquity, through, through history, he was given the title of Rabban, R-A-B-B-A-N. And what it means is the one who understands the beauty of the law. When he died, it was said that since Robin Gamaliel died, there has been no more reverence for the law. And purity and abstinence died at the same time. When the Sanhedrin seemed likely to resort to violence against the apostles, Gamaliel intervenes. The Pharisees at that time had this understanding. It's this weird line of fate and free will, of God designing and yet us choosing how we respond. So Gamaliel steps in and he says, listen, you guys can act like this in your free will, but what if it was God's design to put these people in place? You may be fighting against God. Can I give you a little side note here? This is why I like Gamaliel. Every one of us needs a level-headed friend. Anybody else been to that place where you are hot-headed, you're ready to blow, you're mad at somebody, you're mad at your boss, you're mad at your family, and you're like, I'm, I'm taking them out. I'm just like, I'm going to let them have it. you got to have that friend that goes, hey, relax. Let's just, let's just slow down a little bit. Take a deep breath. You've got to have that person. God brings these people into our lives. Be grateful for them because Gamaliel here, being that person in the room, speaks truth. We need those people who will speak truth to us in those moments. Gamaliel's point is be careful what you're saying at or against people because you think you're standing up for God when you might be fighting against him. You think you're trying to make sure the pecking order is correct, but you may just be trying to put yourself and your own opinions and what you want on the throne as king or leader. Gamaliel says, you know what? You fight against these people, you may be fighting against God. Was he right? Well, the message they gave is the same message we preach 2,000 years later today. It's the same message that's preached in every city in this country this morning. It's the same message that's preached in Europe and Africa and India and Asia and Australia. Everywhere where people are proclaiming scriptures, they're proclaiming this truth. God was going to carry it through. Let me give you three kind of take-home points. These are the three points in your bulletin. Here's the first thing. The fight to be faithful isn't comfortable. The fight to be faithful isn't comfortable. Peter and John, they get out of jail. I don't know about you, but I, my natural being says, hey, I'm bolting. If I got an angel letting me out of jail, I'm putting on my track shoes, and I am out of town. But the angel who sets him free says, all right, We're getting you out so you can stand right here and keep proclaiming this message. It says later on, and they're beaten for it. They're beaten for it, and they say, thank you, Jesus, that we were beaten. In our country, we get mad if someone won't let us say Christmas. They were beaten, and they praise God for the opportunity to do so. Being faithful, the fight to be faithful is not comfortable. And I want to challenge you just like myself. I don't want to fight for my position. I want to point people to the cross. I want to fight for faithfulness to that. 
It never has been and never will be comfortable. We'll talk about this in a minute, but every time there's been a move of God anywhere around the world, it's kind of a hobby of mine. I love studying from Scripture up to this modern day when God moved in different countries and different time frames. You can't ask, what about my reputation? What about my position? What about what I love in ministry? What about my favorite ministry? What if God chooses to move in a different way? The fight to be faithful isn't comfortable. It's a calling and a cause that has to triumph over comfort. It's a calling and a cause that has to triumph over comfort. And this is an individual question that requires an individual answer. It's a fight to faithfulness for each one of us. Here's the second thing. Fight for the message that hasn't changed. Fight for the message that hasn't changed. Act 5, starting at verse 30 through 32. It says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. When we get to Acts 15, we're going to see that this message left the boundaries and left the building of just Israel and it's for all of us. We are witnesses of these things and so it is the and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now listen, the church loves to fight about a lot of different things. If you've been in church for a while, you know this is true. We will fight for our favorite ministry. We will fight for our favorite people. We will fight for our favorite chair. Jesus says, fight for the message. But my men's ministry, my women's ministry, what about the kids? What about the students? You know what? God will use different formats and flavors. He always has all through history. But we fight for the message. That doesn't change. Fight for the message and stay faithful to it. Faithfulness is not easy. Fight for it. The message is clear and hasn't changed. Fight for it. And then thirdly, don't fight against God. And most of you are like, no kidding. Like, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and go, I just want to punch God in the face. None of us are going to do that. None of us intentionally get something and goes, I think I'm going to fight God today. Bring it. You know, what a, I don't like my odds if I'm fighting God, first of all, but how many of us fight God in a different way? He prompts you. His Holy Spirit prompts you towards something of faithfulness. Maybe it's to talk to someone, and inside you're fighting him the entire time. God, not now. I'm going to be late. Not now. Look who's looking. This is a very public place. What do you mean pray with them? How about I pray for them? Amen. No, what if God's called you to step out? Don't fight God in this thing. Don't fight God in how he may choose to move. Lord, look what's going on over there. I don't like it. What if that's what God is choosing to use right now? Don't fight God. Every move of God, as I said before, has been fought by the religious establishment. Every one of them. There's idea, this idea that God can't move anymore. God can't move because the way I like to do church is over. The songs I like to sing are gone. The order of service is gone. The structure, whatever. We say God can't move. Maybe things are so bad, God just can't move because look how bad things are. God obviously can't do anything with this. Lie. God absolutely is still at work. I want to take a look back for a second at these Sadducees and these Pharisees. Because you see, the Sadducee camp looked at, looked at these Jesus followers and said, we're going to lose our favor. We're going to lose our, our seats in the important places. The people are starting to like them better because G- they're living out this Jesus call to love the sick and the poor and the orphan and the widow and the outcast and the people no one wants to talk to. This whole message is spreading around Jerusalem. They're getting popular and we're getting unpopular. As John the Baptist said, he's increasing and I'm decreasing. And we got to be okay with that. And if we're not like like the Sadducees, we're going to fight God. Flip it to the other side and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are saying, these guys are heretics because we know the law. We know the Bible. And yet in knowing the Bible, they miss Jesus. We know how it's supposed to go, and if it doesn't go law and order just the way we said, then it can't be God. I see how they're doing it. That can't be God. 
I see how they're praying. I see what they're standing on. That can't be God. Why? Because that's not what I believe. That's not how I do it. Both groups fighting for their own rights miss God and end up fighting God. But here's the cool thing. When we get further into the book of Acts, you're going to see that there are Sadducees who even in their love for, love for people fell in love with Jesus and become part of the church. You're going to see Pharisees even in their love for everything to be T's cross, I's dotted, correct, fall in love with Jesus first. Don't fight God, embrace him. Embrace him. If something's not of God, he'll pull it down. He'll take care of that. But if something is of him, join on. Jesus meets, uh, Jesus can meet either group right where they are. Stop fighting for our position. Stop fighting for our places. Kerry Nywolf, he's a, uh, a church guy. He writes a lot of stuff on studying church history and the church. He says the move of God in the future church will be about, an ex- about existing members r- rallying around the mission that is not fundamentally about them, but about Christ and the, lo- the world he loves. The future move of, cr- of the church will be about existing members rallying around the mission that is not fundamentally about them, but about Christ and the world that he loves. Matt Chandler is a pastor and in Dallas, Texas, and he likes to point out faulty thinking of the church, and and especially in the past. He says, when when we look forward to what God will do, here's the problems we're running into. Matt says, there's this idea that there was a time in human history where everybody went to church, everybody believed in Jesus, everybody knew their Bible, and everybody was glad to be a Christian. Chandler says, that's never happened, ever. Ever. So when you believe that lie, and in America, that kind of works like all of our founding fathers were Christians. They all loved Jesus. It's just not true. Some of them did, absolutely. Certainly, there was a shared moral vision, but many of them were theists. One of them cut up the Bible and made his own Bible. That was Thomas Jefferson. I've seen it. He rewrote the Bible and took out all the miracles. So you can't be like... Chandler goes on to say, so you can't be like our founding fathers love the Lord when one of them took some scissors to the Bible. He goes on to say, the key to renewal and revival has nothing to do with things outside of the church. It has everything to do with what's inside of the church. So if you're outraged by politics, if you're outraged by this and that, then really I think you've placed your hope on the wrong thing. Regardless of who runs in 2020, Christ is king. And if you put your hope there who, and to who runs in 2020, you're going to get angry. What terrible, fragile things to put your hope in. Nations have come and nations have gone, but Christ has remained constant. Don't fight against God. Don't try and put a human being, whether political, spiritual, emotional, whatever. Don't try and put a person where only God can be. And don't give ear and allow someone to lead you in a direction when you know God is calling you into something different. Don't look for a human to do what Christ alone can do with his church. And I stand by the statement that was made that the church is God's plan A with no plan B. And we, individually and corporately, are that church. Like Gamaliel, let's see what God is up to. And let's watch how he may be choosing to work. Would you bow your heads with me, please? So my homework for you this week is twofold. Number one, read Acts 6, because you'll be there uh, next week. You'll be hearing that. I think it's Adam next week. We'll be talking to you about Acts 6. But here's the other part. I want to challenge you this week, once again, as we will in most of the weeks of this series, Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and be faithful to follow through. Don't fight against God. You don't know how he wants to use you. You don't know how he may be prompting you for school, for work, for your family. Don't fight against what God may prompting, be prompting you to do for his purposes. That person he may be leading you to, whether family, friend, or complete stranger, is either in a spot 
where they're looking for God. They know God, and maybe they can use the encouragement, or they don't know him at all, and you may be the first voice to speak to them the truth. Let's make it a charge. Let's make it a challenge for each one of us to be faithful in saying, God, I'll listen. God, I'll respond. Father, thank you for your spirits leading and prompting. Thank you for the opportunity that we can gather here and be the church gathered. But thank you, Lord, that as these doors open in a few minutes and as we leave, we're the church scattered and we're still light in our community. We're still salt that brings flavor and brings healing. We're a salve, Lord God, um, a medicine to those who, who, who may be in a place where they're just wounded. God, I pray that we will be faithful like, like Peter and John. And Lord, I pray that when we're missing that, you'll bring the people like Gamaliel into our life to speak truth in both a loving and graceful way. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.